from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello, my name is Alyssa Carroll, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. This is my Halloween episode, guys, so happy Halloween to the murder family. I really hope you've had a good spooky season this year. And special thanks to some of my patrons, as always. Pixie, Maya, Alethea, Elena, Aaron, Katoris, Catherine, Sam, Linda, two Janices, Katarina, Teresa, Sarah, Sophie, Nanette, my two Emmas, Emily, Gabrielle, Galen, Cassandra, Bree, David, John, and my feisty girl, Judy. Thank you so, so much, guys. You are truly appreciated. And for anyone else, please feel free to join the patron family so that I can continue bringing these stories that you crave. So this week's podcast will be on Frederick Bailey Deeming, who is one of the higher suspects, potentially, to be Jack the Ripper. Frederick was born on July 30th, 1853 in Leicestershire, England. So as we always do, let's get into some history for that time. Franklin Pierce was inaugurated as the 14th president of the United States, but on religious grounds, he chose to affirm rather than to swear the executive oath of office. He was a famed officer of a volunteer brigade in the Mexican War and was nominated as the Democratic candidate on the ballot. And speaking of the Mexican War, a treaty was created to provide joint Mexican and American protection for the SLU grant that was signed. Charles Darwin received the Royal Medal of the Royal Society, which is the highest honor the society could give to a scientist. It was awarded for his three-volume work on the geology of the Beagle Voyage and for his barnacle research that was in process at the time. Darwin was quite proud that his peers had come to esteem his work so highly. This solidified his reputation as a biologist. Heinrich Steinway, who was Building his pianos and organs, originally in Germany, moved operations over to the United States and founded Steinway and Sons in New York in 1853. They absolutely dominated the market. The clothing company Levi Strauss and Company was founded. Manchester was granted city status in the United Kingdom and the first public aquarium opened at the London Zoo in 1853. The Great Industrial Exhibition was held in Dublin, Ireland. It was the largest international event to be held in Ireland, and the Irish Industrial Exhibition building itself captivated most all of its visitors. Also in 1853, the first true international meteorological organization was established in Brussels, Belgium. New Zealand acquired self-government, and later in the year, the Ottoman Empire began war with Russia. So guys, this was the overall global atmosphere that Frederick was born into. His father was Thomas Deeming, and his mother was Anne Bailey. Thomas was born in 1824 in Warwickshire, England. He was the second of five children. Thomas's father and a couple of his brothers had all perished in coal mining accidents. He himself grew up to be a coppersmith, though he had started in the local coal mines as well, where he allegedly fell 30 feet down a shaft and luckily landed in a pool of water, but he did suffer a substantial head injury. Now, Anne was born in 1826, grew up in the same area, and she and Thomas married in 1846. 
she was 20 years old, Thomas was 22. And then, those sources vary, they went on to have 12 children together according to Ancestry sites. The fourth baby, Sarah, died before she was a year old and Frederick was then number five. According to the book, quote, The Devil's Work by Gary Lionel, Thomas was less than thrilled with Anne being pregnant again and was occasionally, physically, and most certainly verbally abusive toward her during the pregnancy. He also, in his paranoia or mental illness, would sometimes proclaim that the baby was not his. According to author Gary Lionel and the Daily Mail, Thomas, quote, swung between black moods and a fierce temper and a chorus of voices in his head, he believed one of their homes was haunted, end quote. Frederick's older brother, Edward, stated, quote, he was a most passionate man and when out of temper, had no control over himself. Frederick was never a favorite of my father's. He seemed to have taken a dislike to him from his birth, end quote. While some sources differ, Gary's book states that Thomas allegedly abandoned the family when Frederick was still quite small, that he simply left for work one day and never returned. Anne was said to have been obviously scared and humiliated and went door to door until she found him and they managed to get back together. Sources state that Frederick was quite the difficult child and always sort of on the fringes of sanity as it was described. It was said that he had been known as, quote, Mad Fred due to his abnormal behavior. This could be because allegedly his father dealt out very severe beatings to his children and as such, as Frederick was growing up, it was said that he much preferred the company and friendship of girls rather than other boys. He also cared very much about his outward appearances. His brother described him as vain. Now his father attempted suicide a few times throughout his life by trying to cut his own throat. His own sons, including Frederick at an age, would have to physically restrain him and get the razor out of his hand. So his relationship with his mother really wasn't much better. She was a Sunday school teacher who, quote, instilled her puritanical interpretation of the scriptures to him, end quote, according to casebook.org. She was apparently obsessed with the concepts of sin and punishment, mixing deep rooted religion and science, and she insisted Frederick carry a Bible with him everywhere he went. It was said that she told him with regularity that he disgusted her and that he was, quote, the spawn of the devil himself, a twisted, evil thing she should never have pushed from her womb, end quote. And yet she did try to protect him as much as she could from his father and all sources indicated that she did love him in her own way. Now, Frederick's older brother, later interviewed, said that he had tried to protect Frederick from the brunt of their father's abuses, but it was difficult because Frederick was hard to keep tame. He said that from an early age, he had an intense temper like their father's. At four years old, he had already battled scarlet fever and smallpox. As he got older, it was said on an ancestry site that he worked with two of his brothers as a plumber and gas fitter, but as he got older, his being able to tolerate his father became less and less. Frederick, by the age of 12 or 13, was known to disappear for sometimes weeks at a time on fishing boats, which, of course, enraged his father. At 16 years old, it was reported that he finally ran away from home and off to sea and from there, he began his life of crime. Mostly theft, fraud, and so on, but he always seemed to return home after some time at sea. And that, folks, was his childhood. And I really think it speaks for itself, but let's touch on some things. 
Though I have had some people try to argue with me that no physical harm can happen to a fetus while in utero, well, that's simply not true when it comes to the mother being physically abused. And the stress hormones that the mother releases during this abuse also affect the baby and the development of the brain. Emotional stress during pregnancy has strong associations with maternal anxiety disorders, infant cortisol reactivity, cognitive and emotional development, and a more difficult temperament in the offspring, including negative affectivity and poor attentional regulation. Now, Thomas, his father, suffered with mental illness that I couldn't find a specific diagnosis for, but we know he heard voices and had suicidal ideation. Now, the question would be whether or not he had developed this before or was it a direct result of his severe head trauma? There's really no way to know. We can possibly get a sense of Thomas already having existing issues because Frederick's temper was much like his father's. Whether we can chalk that up to nature or nurture, well, we really can't say. But what we do know is that his mother was a religious fanatic. All sources made a point to mention how unwavering and intense her belief in her religion really was. Again, she was obsessed with the ideas of sin and punishment. According to Psychology Today, religious fundamentalism, which refers to the belief in the absolute authority of a religious text or leaders because it discourages any logical reasoning or scientific evidence that challenges its scripture, making it inherently maladaptive. While moderate versions of Christianity and Islam can promote qualities like a sense of community and a moral code that fosters ethical behavior, harmful fundamentalist versions cause the brain to process information in a biased way, causing irrationality and delusions. Religious fundamentalism is strongly correlated with what psychologists and neuroscientists call, quote, magical thinking making connections between actions and events when no such connections exist in reality. And then, outside of that, she was both, let's say, Mary the Virgin and Mary Magdalene, sinner and saint. She both loved him and tried to shield him from his father while also belittling him and telling him he was an abomination. We see this maternal Jekyll and Hyde behavior in a few of our more famous serial killers. It was Sigmund Freud who said, quote, Where such men love, they have no desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. End quote. A son from an abusive mother will just as likely love her as hate her. Sons with mothers like Frederick or even Ed Gein will display behaviors such as avoidance and detachment in relationships, distrust of females, emotional issues in childhood and in adult life. Overly controlling mothers may lead their sons to hate them. I know he can be controversial, but clinical psychologist Jordan B. Peterson has written and talked extensively on complex mother-son relationships, and I agree with a lot of his take on the subject. The stress and abuse at home was so intense that it led him to running away for small, extended periods of time where he did not have to deal with it. And escaping is one very easy way to deal with life stress. And we know that Frederick himself was a rather difficult child on his own. He was just a very young teenager when he began to commit criminal acts. The way his brother described him, he most likely had an inflated ego, a high level of self-importance and behavioral issues, along with a mean temper, all signs of a possible conduct disorder that could manifest as antisocial personality disorder into adulthood. So I think that we very likely have a boy with a genetic propensity toward antisocial behaviors and mental health issues brought into a world full of violence, anger, and religious fanaticism. So what could go wrong? 
back and forth frederick would go out to sea and see other lands and even other continents and then eventually return home and then though his relationship with his mother was intense to say the least she died it was said she had a diseased liver most likely cancer and had died at home in 1877 she was 51 years old and frederick was 24. Very soon after, he fell ill, quote unquote, and began saying that he saw his mother floating outside of his window. He quickly took a job as a steward on a steamer ship in early 1878 and wound up in India. Not long after, he was admitted to a local hospital there. The doctor noted that Frederick had tonsillitis, but, quote, regularly suffered from shivering and fevers that might have been malarial, end quote. 83 days he stayed in that hospital, nearly three months, and in that time, the nurses stated that he began having epileptic seizures and kept getting worse and worse. Toward the end, they said that he had many seizures a day, once up to 14 in one day. He would come in and out of consciousness, and they were forced to tie him down. When he was awake, sometimes the right side of his body would be paralyzed or would twitch for a week solid or more. But when he was finally able to travel, he was sent by ship back home to England. One of his brothers stated that he was home for three months straight, quite sick, and it seemed to affect his mental state. He was seen in the wee early hours one morning, walking in his night clothes, which back then was kind of like a nightgown, a waistcoat and a bouquet of flowers going presumably nowhere. At other times, he dressed entirely in black as if he were in perpetual mourning. And that's not to be confused with modern day dressing, which is now all considered normal, but back then it wasn't. His brothers all said he would ramble on and mumble to the point that they could not even make out what he was saying. People reported hearing him talk quite loudly to absolutely no one. And yet he met and married a woman named Marie James in 1881. She saw in him some level of potential that really no one else saw, though it is believed that at 26 years old, Marie was really just trying to avoid the old maid stereotype. Marie's sister had married one of Frederick's brothers, and that is how they met. Not long after the wedding, Frederick informed his wife that he was going to be traveling to Australia, a country he had been to once previously during his travels, and he would send for her once he got settled there. Once he arrived there, he got a good job, but in trying to get the money to pay for his wife's journey to be with him, he began stealing and subsequently selling parts from his employer. He was arrested and sentenced to six months hard labor in prison. Once in prison, he began having his seizures again, but eventually recovered. So after time served, he sent for Marie, and the pair moved down to Melbourne. Not long after, Marie discovered she was pregnant. And during all of this, Frederick was still getting into trouble with the law. They quickly had two daughters, fairly back to back, that they named Bertha and Marie. And yet he was having affairs with local barmaids and motels. He spent money frivolously, dressing himself in expensive clothing and wearing diamond rings on multiple fingers. He would impress people with grand tales of his overseas adventures and sometimes would use false names, but these grand days were short-lived and his creditors began taking him to court for money that he owed them. He would, quote, cook the books, as they say, and his business dealings would find the large discrepancies. With his wife very pregnant with their third child, he finally was sent to prison again. Once he was released, he took his wife and children and moved to South Africa in 1888. They exited the boat as Mr. and Mrs. Ward. It was witnessed there that he was verbally abusive to Marie. 
Now, they weren't in that area long before the family boarded a ship headed to London. Marie went into labor while on the ship. There was no doctor or any medical staff aboard, and another woman and her husband helped Marie with her birth to their first son and third child that they named Sydney. And as we already know, London was both home to the greatest wealth and power at that time, as well as the most horrific living conditions in the slums. We also know that the first officially recognized Jack the Ripper victim, Mary Polly Nichols, was found slain on August 31st, 1888 at the entrance of a stable in a back alley in Whitechapel. Her throat had been cut twice. One slice had gone so deep, her vertebrae was the only thing keeping her head attached. Her abdomen had been slashed and part of her intestines had been removed. There were two other women before Miss Nichols, but the differences have kept them off of the firmly established Ripper murders. Now, there's about an 18-month stretch of time where Frederick's whereabouts are pretty hazy between March of 1888 and October of 1889. He went to great lengths to cover his tracks, but reports have him located in Liverpool, Plymouth, and Devon. One of his older brothers had reported that his brother had visited him and other family in the back half of 1888, and it is known for sure that he was in England in October of 1889 because he was busted, posing as an Australian farmer who raises sheep for market using the false name Harry Lawson. And then also, his father Thomas died in 1889 from salinity, quote-unquote, as an inmate of the Tranmere Workhouse. This was a facility that housed the poor, the sick, and the mentally ill. So it does seem at least plausible that he would be in England during the Ripper murders. He was imprisoned under the name Harry Lawson in 1890 in England. And yet, it is most probable that he remained bouncing around the South African area, making appearances in Port Elizabeth, Durban, Klerksdorp, and Johannesburg, swindling and committing bank fraud with falsified documents. While completely illegal, he was netting an astonishing amount of money. Whether or not he was in England during the Jack the Ripper murders, it was during his early days in South Africa that he went to a doctor who diagnosed him with syphilis, and also during this time, he began telling people that his dead mother was visiting him and speaking to him. He later said she was telling him to kill his wife. In February 1890, Frederick was roaming about and came across a room for rent. The owner, a widow, had a daughter whom he soon married. She was 21-year-old Nellie Matheson. Now, of course, the marriage wasn't legal as he was still married to Marie. Nellie was at first impressed with his ruggedly handsome looks, saying his manner was, quote, suave and engaging. But soon after the marriage, he told his young bride that he had to sail to Belgium on business. And while he did go to Belgium, he was there mostly visiting sex workers and sending very expensive paintings back to England on credit, telling everyone his name was Lord Dunn. But Nellie and her mother eventually found him in Belgium, where he was slyly conning many businesses out of money. He then began silently sending his belongings and possessions to a storage facility. As Nellie waited for her husband to join her for tea one day, he abandoned her and boarded a train to London. From London, he hopped onto a boat headed to Uruguay. The reason he abandoned her was because, well, one, Marie had found out that he had married another woman and had hunted him down and threatened to turn him in if he didn't send more money for her to care for their children, and two, because detectives from South Africa were still trying to locate him as well. But once he was in Uruguay, he was arrested and deported back to England, where he was imprisoned for four months and reportedly 
was a most difficult prisoner. During this, Marie had told Nellie that he was still married to her and Nellie had had enough. That relationship was over. So in 1891, Marie wrote a letter to a friend stating she had joined her husband in Rainhill, England, just outside of Liverpool. During his travels, Frederick was wooing women, although one had to contact the captain of the ship they were on to ask for protection from him and and he had also somehow acquired a lion cub that he decided to keep chained in his yard. Someone offered to buy it, but he wanted such an insane amount of money for it, the person turned him down. Finally, Marie was able to find someone to just take the cub after it had bitten some of the neighborhood children and the parents were obviously irate. Marie would soon discover that, while she was sleeping with her husband, who actively had syphilis, she was pregnant with their fourth child. Frederick was 38 years old. He took off again under the assumed name Albert Williams, boasting that he was a senior army official. He leased a house and then began flirting with a young woman named Emily Mather, only this time Marie had located him again, and so he put her and the children up in a leased house while renting a hotel room for himself so that he could continue his relationship with Emily. He told people that the women and children were his sister and her children, though everyone believed otherwise. He was fair-skinned with light eyes and a ginger mustache. Marie was darker-skinned with dark hair, they looked absolutely nothing alike. Not long after Marie and the children were settled in, in September 1891, Frederick murdered Marie and their four young children, including the infant she had just recently had. He had slit the throats of all of them, save Bertha, who he had strangled. He buried the bodies under the fireplace in his then rented house. He then covered their graves with several layers of concrete. Shortly after, he married Emily and took her off to Australia to a rented house in Melbourne. Once they were settled, that Christmas Eve, Frederick took a small axe and bludgeoned Emily in the head, then cut her throat. Once she was dead, he buried her under the hearthstone in the home's second bedroom. But never you fret, because he now was calling himself Baron Swanston. He had already charmed yet another 19-year-old young woman named Kate Roundsfell and was waiting for her to travel from Sydney to where he was in Southern Cross, east of Perth. Now, in March 1892, a month after Frederick had murdered Emily, a potential lodger began to complain of a horrible smell emanating from the second bedroom. So the owner and another man raised the hearthstone and were met with the most unimaginable foul stench that they said they found themselves barely able to breathe. The police were summoned and Emily's body was found. Her autopsy showed her skull was fractured from several blows and that her throat had indeed been cut. The police investigation eventually led them to the house that Frederick had been renting for Marie and the children. They discovered cement had been ordered for that house as well. Just days later, Marie and the four children's decomposing bodies were discovered. At this point, with interviews very well underway, they knew many of Frederick's aliases and sent out to find him. And before his new lady could even get to him, the police finally located him in Southern Cross and arrested him in March of 1892, and they extradited him to Victoria, Australia. His arrival was met with angry crowds. Something quite interesting I found out was that his defense attorney was Alfred Deakin, who would go on to later become the Australian Prime Minister. Alfred and his wife especially believed in the supernatural and mediums and so on, and that's a whole other story for another time, but he was tried for the murder of Emily Mather and found guilty. 
The trial really only lasted for four days. While he was awaiting his sentencing, he said that his dead mother was taunting him at night in his jail cell. He also said that he had been out many a night with a gun to kill women who had given him venereal diseases. He absolutely loathed sex workers, especially, and felt right in, quote, exterminating them. He denied that one of his wives was actually dead, a delusion that he kept going with. He proudly proclaimed to all in the courtroom, quote, It is not giving up this life I fear, not the slightest. I have gone through the world, and after the dangers I have faced, I am not afraid to give up my life. I have been on the Zambezi among the black fellows and have been battered about the head and gone among bears and gone into lion's caves and brought them out alive, as it has been stated in the papers, and now they are alive in the hands of the men in England." End quote. He was hanged in the Melbourne prison in May of 1892. He was buried in an unmarked grave in the Melbourne prison grounds and then later exhumed and buried again at the Pentridge prison. There was a cast of his handmaid and allegedly his face as well. Now, to the Jack the Ripper portion, right? So it really didn't seem to take long for people to suspect Frederick might have been Jack the Ripper. There is a very high probability that he was in England in late 1888 when Jack was committing the Whitechapel murders. His father had died during that time, and one of his brothers stated Frederick was indeed visiting family during the crucial window for Jack the Ripper. Again, most skeptics state that he was in jail during the murders, but it has since been proven that he was in fact not in jail during Jack's dates. The way that Frederick murdered his victims was quite similar to Jack's method, and the motive would have been easy to understand as he was so angry with sex workers because one had given him syphilis. It is widely agreed that the Jack the Ripper murderer had a pathological hatred of sex workers, and this alone could be a symptom of someone suffering from neurosyphilis. Now, neurosyphilis, according to NIH.gov, states that it is a disease of the coverings of the brain, the brain itself, or the spinal cord, and occurs in people with syphilis, especially if they are left untreated. There are different levels and kinds, of course, but symptoms include an abnormal walk or gait or unable to walk, numbness in the toes, feet, or legs, problems with thinking, such as confusion or poor concentration, mental problems including depression and irritability, headaches, seizures, and many more. You see, the seizures especially, but many of the other symptoms match Frederick's overall health. Frederick had admitted to two respected physicians who were examining him for trial, stated that he had contracted syphilis from a sex worker and on at least four separate occasions, he had gone searching for one of them with the intent to kill. A witness to Jack described him as a fair mustached man, which of course Frederick did wear. Another woman, knowing him under the name of Lawson, stated that he was courting her in London during the time of the Whitechapel murders and seemed obsessively interested in one of Jack's victims. Frederick, after arriving back in Melbourne, asked a jeweler to clean a pair of blood-stained surgical dissecting knives, which are thought to be what Jack the Ripper used on his victims. While in prison, Frederick admitted to other prisoners that he was Jack the Ripper and that the disease he had gotten from a sex worker had caused him to have seizures and brain disease, which caused him to kill. So I've left a couple of links below in the notes if you'd like to travel down this rabbit hole. And I'm not entirely convinced myself, but I can see why he would be quite high on the suspect list for sure. Will we ever truly know who Jack the Ripper was? My opinion is that I don't think we ever will, but I'd love to be proven wrong. So tell me, guys, what do you think? 
Leave me a comment below if you're watching, or you can DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. You can email me. All of my contact information is below. And most importantly, thank you so much for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, guys, and have a great Halloween.